Spring is in the books. Let's head toward August. Mark Rogers, TV, the voice of college football, talking up Florida State football. We got to James Coleman on the line as we do on a regular basis. You can catch James at Big Game James 36 on Twitter, fifth quarter college football as well, Sports Den Live as well. James, how you doing today? Doing good, man. It's nice and warm in Florida. Spring football for high school is um, going on, so big time recruiting um, coming down these parts. Everybody comes, all the coaches, I think, come to take a little vacation and see some of the best talent in the nation. It's not nice and warm here. We got fooled with some 80-degree days a couple weeks ago and then went back down into the 50s, so we're going to have to suffer through this for maybe another 10 days or so. All right, James, uh, let's uh, get to it uh, when we talk spring practice. Uh, trying to think the last time we had you on, uh, I believe, was in the middle of uh, practice, uh, the 15 sessions. Actually, it was just uh, going to the spring game, so you're headed toward the spring game. About to do it up big. I had a big, uh, hopefully you had a nice uh, reunion with everyone. Yeah, it was great. Um, every year we have our, uh, well, this is the second year, so I guess it's annual now. <laughs> Alumni reunion wasn't as big as it was the first year, rightfully so. Um, sometimes a combination of it being the first time and also coming off of the worst year you had um, in recent program history. Um, doesn't have people as excited, but it was still good to see a lot of the old faces a decent crowd. I think I looked at where when they ranked, we were top 10 when it came to crowds for spring games. And, and I think that's still saying a lot for the Taggart effect um, and, and things going on. But uh, we had a nice tailgate um, fifth quarter of Doug Boys at 36 degrees. We had about 300 people come to a spring game tailgate. Um, it was great. Good time, good energy. And you saw a lot of what you want to see in the spring game. I always call spring games uh, kindergarten graduation or uh, Easter play. Uh, you just really hope when your child goes up there that they don't forget their lines and they don't mess up and that they just do the stupid dance, the song really, really nice, so you can all clap and go go to a buffet afterwards and, 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 and hype it up. So, I mean, you saw a little bit of what Brown – the best thing you saw was organization and tempo. And that's what I think Browse brings to the table that that was not brought last year with Tagger trying to understand everything and and um, Walt Bell not really having a full understanding of how to run this type of tempo offense. So we, we got through no injuries. Uh, we got a chance to see enough of what we needed to see. And again, they're going to try to toss the ball around the yard and try to run the ball. So. The good thing, what I what I what I wanted to see was how well the offensive line blocked, and I wanted to see how well how well the O line blocked and how well we made decisions and got rid of the ball. Yeah, when you can avoid uh, first and fifteen or first and twenty, where the defense doesn't even have to do anything to get you behind the sticks, and it's all just uh, not getting lined up properly and knowing the snap count. Then, if you can clean those things up, then that's the uh, first step in the right direction before you actually have to do anything against the defense. We got James Coleman on the line from Fifth Quarter College Football. You can also catch him on his uh, weekly podcast, Sports Den Live. James Coleman at uh, Big Games thir James Thirty Six. Of course, you're locked in at Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football, where we bring on the best bloggers, broadcasters, and writers in the industry for the very best in discussion, debate, and analysis. So lock it in right here. Subscribe, like the videos, comment, and share the videos as well. Only two Knowles in the NFL draft. Right. Just two. Brian Burns obviously um, came off the board, I believe, in the second round. I don't have the numbers no. in front of me. For 15th overall pick. 15th overall pick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did um, watch the draft. <laughs> it's just not locking in right now. Yeah. So uh, your thoughts about his uh, prospectus moving forward? He made the best decision. It was right for him. I mean, there was really no nothing more he needed to show in college unless he just wanted to not leave with a losing record um, as his final year. But when you look at the defensive ends that have come through Florida State, um, that have been really, that have been truly great. Um, he ranks up there. Um, he's uh, maybe not the top, top, top guys, but he's similar to what we've seen with a uh, Cam Wembley or a uh, uh, Everett Brown, who actually played for, got drafted by the Panthers. Uh, and he reminds me of a combination between both of them. I mean, he's a not an undersized 
per se right now, but he's a guy that's going to have to work to maintain 250 pounds. But the way he's explosive off the edge and his bend um, and his ability to get to the um, pass rusher lets him be a guy that can put his hand in the ground or you can actually stand him up and let him be a 3-4 rusher, um, off the edge rusher. So it's all about if he's going to continue to progress. He's very not the best in the run game, so which is a big part of the NFL, but really it's a passing league. So if he's able to get sacks consistently he'll play for a long time um ironically that's where his brother was drafted a few um some years ago to carolina in the seventh round so it was very nice to see that um i didn't go with any expectations that a lot of seminoles were going to get drafted if you listen to anything i, I believe that fsu season would be better but if you really look at pay attention to the talent wise jimbo's the jimbo recruiting classes have had a lot of misses a lot of hits a lot of misses and there are some development issues so when you look at the senior class, Nyquan Murray would have needed to have a really big year to be able to be considered a draft pick because he's not, he's not a tall wide receiver. He's not a fast wide receiver. He's not a big wide receiver. He's just a guy. He's just a guy. So you need production when you're like that. Um, we didn't really um, – the other D tackles were young. I mean, you saw a lot of guys get picked up with roster spots, but – Two draft picks on this team that had so many people critique them about how bad they looked is actually saying a lot. Um, that that's that's actually a win. I look at not necessarily how many people you had drafted, but where they got drafted to and what round they got drafted in. If you have got, I like the guys who have the most drafted in the first three rounds because if we're being realistic, those are the guys who probably aren't going to get cut that season. Fourth round and, and um lower, depending on where you went, you stand a chance to probably see yourself not not go, not, um, not be on that team for very long. The other Florida State uh, player drafted uh, DeMarcus at Christmas defensive tackle who went to Seattle in the sixth round. And this is a guy that uh, if you watch Florida State football, you've been watching him on the field for a long time. He did uh, miss a few games e each season, but pretty much uh, since his freshman season has been on the field quite a bit. Uh, so a number of other guys you mentioned, are those guys that when you mentioned Murray in particular and a few other guys, have those guys latched on with free agent to contracts? Yeah, almost every senior, um, almost everybody who entered the draft is in camp um, with somebody. DeMarcus Christmas, even though he got drafted in the sixth round, I think the situation plays well for him. He's got to wake up and decide if he wants, like, you, you, football is one of those things where, no matter what the situation is, if you don't buy in and you try to do things your own way, it's going to be hard for you. Your best bet is to buy in and give 100% effort, even if you think it's stupid. And I think what he what he what he learned he got what he learned was not buying in hurt his hurt his pockets. So hopefully he's matured, and I wish him nothing but success on um, out where he's at in Seattle. We're on the line with Big Game James Coleman, 36. Catch him on Twitter. Uh, of course, played for Florida State at fullback from 2002 to 2005. Joins me on a regular basis here at Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. Lock it in right here. Share the video. Subscribe, like, and comment to keep us going. You can help build the channel by grabbing the Amazon link down in the description section below the video to help, again, build the channel. doesn't cost you a penny. Do your regular shopping at Amazon. Just use that link. All right, James, let's uh, move it on to recruiting where Jalen McCluster was snatched up just in the last uh, 10 or 12 hours, a four-star linebacker out of uh, Tampa. Have you had a chance to uh, scout him at all? Yes, yes. Um, very explosive player, um, very instinctual. He's a heavy hitter, so he's not. A, he's a true – he's a true Mike. Um, more of a um, – like definitely inside guy, got to learn, got to get a little bit more athletic, a little bit more, a little faster, more fluid, um, so that he can be able to be effective in the pass game. But I think he's he's gonna remind FSU fans a lot of Dontavious Jackson, who we have already. Like we gotta have, we, we didn't have a, we haven't he 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 grew into a thumper this year, Jackson. So what we need is some guys who are gonna come in and be able to set the tone and that's what your inside linebackers have to do is set the tone and McCluster coming out of Largo, Florida. That's that Tampa area for people who don't know Florida. He's a downhill guy is going to be able to hit. And it's amazing with Raymond Woody reestablishing those roots in Tampa. It's very difficult to go up against. And there's a couple more guys off of that team and in that Tampa area 
who probably will end up in FSU's recruiting class. Um, but I think McCluster was definitely a great add. Uh, Miami wanted him bad. A lot of people thought he was going to go to Miami. There was some good. There was some good feelings for that, especially coming off of losing um, Sampa. I think that's how he says his last name. A uh, young man who just committed to LSU. So it was good to see FSU gaining some momentum. It was very quiet. Uh, we also got Josh Griffiths, who's been a, kind of a known guy that was that was a decommit from Florida, defensive end from IMG Academy. We kind of figured he was going to Florida State. He had that Brian Burns as his um Twitter um uh, his, his Twitter um well, not profile header, his Twitter header. So Florida State again has been getting some getting some good quality talent. And the difference between this class and the last couple classes is that you see these guys are actively recruiting people even coming up with competitions of who's going to be the best recruiter um, in the class for the 2020 season. So Jalen McCluster is rated as the 47th best player in Florida, according to 247 Sports Composite, and the 10th inside linebacker in the country. Also, a offer went out to Roydell Williams, who the crystal ball predictions at 247 Sports as going to Alabama, but Florida State made an offer to him out of Hueytown, Alabama, 13th rated running back uh, in the nation. Again, out of Alabama, Roydell Williams. We got uh, James Coleman on the line from uh, Sports Den Live. That's his podcast on a weekly basis, fifth quarter quarterback. Uh, I do it again. Fifth quarter college football. The cues just come out and they keep rolling, James. Uh, fifth quarter college football. You can catch James right there. Big game, James. 36. All right, let's have some fun. Let's dig into your past fan, player, or the last uh, 10 years or so. I uh, got some questions lined up for you. So the first one would be most exhilarating win doesn't have to be one. You can make a list of three, five, ten, whatever you want it to be, or it can just be one. And when I say exhilarating, I mean I want to take the emphasis off of important. So you can make it an important win. You know, beat Auburn in the national championship game in 2013. Done. Boom. Or it can be some insignificant game to just about everybody else, but it meant something to you. Most exhilarating win or wins? Clemson, I want to say it was 89. When um Dion returned the punt, um, and he told everybody <clears throat> that he was going to return the kick, and it just it was an it was an amazing game. It was good going back and forth. Um, Dion, the way they won that game, Dion returns it and does the um you know kneel down, and you saw Clemson fan try to hit him with a cup of water, a cup of um a beverage, which was funny. Uh, but that just the excitement with that, um. The choke at Doak would be up there as well. I would say 2000, the 2003 victory in the swamp that we had when we were down, I want to say 21, and we came back. And um, PK Sam, excuse me, Chris Ricks to PK Sam, um, that that has to be important in the fight at the end. Heck, actually, that was a, it was a really stupid throw. Um, if I'm being honest, from Chris to PK, we had just converted uh, like a fourth and 15, which I'm glad we didn't have replay then because I'm not 100% sure. Um, uh, Dominic Robinson ran a 15 yard dig at that point. I believe he was right at 14, but you know, who's counting? It doesn't matter now. But it was first down, and Chris went for the like, Chris went for like, and it just so happens that PK got behind the safety and and threw it almost at the back of the end zone and, and, and PK just caught it. It was great. It was um it was very exciting. It was one of the actually I was telling Chris after that. Um I was exhausted. It's like the only thing missing that would make this better is a fight. And then we had a fight. It was, great. <laughs> it, was, it, was it was great times. Uh Virginia Tech in the first ACC championship game. Um we we I tell guys that you know, these young guys don't understand because we've put so much emphasis on, on not necessarily winning because it's always about winning, but the playoffs, the playoffs. But, like, it used to be important to go to a New Year's Day Bowl. Like, that was just it was just, it was really cool because it was an experience for you to see a, a city and playing a game that from a different perspective. When we go on the road, we don't really get a chance. Like, when we play Miami at Miami, you don't get to leave the hotel. Like we're not, we're in Miami, but 
you never see Miami and your family can't take you anywhere. So we went to we went to New Orleans my freshman year. We went to Miami my sophomore year. We played in the Gator Bowl in Jacksonville where I live now. And it was so bad. We had such a terrible time at the Gator Bowl that we were like, we would never experience a game where we have to go to a city that's not a big city or exciting. So <laughs> we were faced with Boise, Idaho or Miami. So we we had this phrase, we're going to play for per diem. Like we're gonna go out, we're gonna go out and we're gonna whoop ass so that we can get better per diem and a better bowl game. So that was the we went out there and man, we like nobody expected that game. Like we we went out there, got after it. Willie Reed had a really great game in a return game. Got like Marcelo Church, many people who don't really know about, had like two sacks, big sacks. Think Cam Wimbley came back. Um everybody made plays, including the guys that became household names later on in the season. So those would be the games that I am. Um, I'm sure there are a lot of fans who remember a lot more, but those are the ones that I believe were, were, were game-changing and program-setting victories. So the one game that you mentioned at Florida to f- close out 2003, down 21, win 38-34. Was that what the score ended up being? I'm looking at 38-34 at Florida... November 29th, 2003. Oh, yeah. Wow. So we beat them pretty good. Like, we were down. Like, they were whooping our 38 okay. 34. Oh, okay. About to say, cause I, I was like, man, 30. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So that was it. Yeah. So beat them by all, four. They're, they're, they're working this, man. Um, so, what game they, are you they, talking about uh, where you had uh, the, the bowl was going to go send you up Virginia north to the bad, northwest if you lost? That was the first ACC championship. Like, the oh, like, yeah. not, not, ACC, like we won rings, we won many ACC championships. Sure. This was the first game, 2005 ACC championship against Virginia Tech when they had Marcus Vick. Okay, 27 uh, 22. There it is. Yeah, and we, I mean, but it was, we got it out, it, got, it was out of hand quick. Like Virginia Tech scored some points late to try to make it interesting, but like we, we had firm control of that game out the gate. All right. Good stuff with Big Game James Coleman. Uh, you can catch him, Big Game James 36 on Twitter. Joins us on a regular basis to uh, talk uh, Florida State football. It's Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. Lock it in right here. All right. Let's go. <laughs> Let's uh, turn the tables on you. So this isn't going to feel too good. Excruciating losses. Again, you can go the player route, the fan route, the uh, media route, uh, whatever course of your life, uh, go back as far as you want. Okay. Um, two as a player, um, 2003 and 2004, um, losing to Clemson at Clemson. Um, that year, 2003, we, um, we only lost to two teams. We lost to Miami twice. So everybody would think like the Miami loss and the pouring down rain would be it, but had we beat Clemson, we would probably be in the national championship game. So that's why it's excruciating because we went up there ranked high and we, we crapped a bed and we we lost a lot. And um so that year was the um, should have been a national championship. The year after that we were in a really good position again when we went to go play Maryland. And uh funny story, I had no we had no idea who Sean Merriman was. Like we we did not like every week they put up a board. These are the guys you gotta look for. Blah blah blah. Uh, these are the good guys. I do not remember Sean Merriman being on that board, but did we know who Sean Merriman was that night? Sean Merriman probably got drafted off of that film um, alone. Um, and we lost to Florida for um, Zook's last game, but it didn't affect where we went anyway because losing that game. Uh, gave Virginia like we 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 had the same ACC record as Virginia Tech, and Virginia Tech had a higher ranking, and they gave them the ACC championship. So it was kind of like we already realized that we weren't playing for we weren't playing for the national championship, and the bowl wasn't that much different. So, but again, we win that game. We go into Florida um, with a little bit different focus because we know we win that game. We're again playing for a national championship, which is I, I always tell fans. You know, don't just let media um, tell you how bad 
things were. Actually go back and look at that stuff for your for as bad as they say some of those last years after the last national championship was, there were a couple couple seasons in there that had the ball bounced a different way. You you would win. Had we not ran into the bus saw with some of the greatest Miami Hurricane teams, we'd probably be in a lot more national championships. But if Bobby never played in Miami, Bobby would probably be Bobby is still the greatest, but Bobby would be would have been Saban esque before Saban if we didn't have or if we had a kicker. But <laughs> so those are the things that you have to um that that those are two right there. I would go as far as to say ninety three losing to Notre Dame when you probably shouldn't have lost to Notre Dame. It worked out that they played in the national championship game, and boy, I know North Carolina State that next week wishes that Florida State had not lost to Notre Dame, but losing that game and then. I'll go shoot, whatever pick a pick a wide right or a wide left. Those yeah, there's a ton the of them. And and, and so James, you're going somewhere that we like to go here, as you well know. We're we're trying to educate the the smart fan and trying to bring up the people that uh, actually want to put things into context. Because yeah. Uh, a lot of other places just look at national championships, end of story, let's move on. And this is the greatest and they're not so good and all this other stuff. But you got to there are all sorts of circumstances out there, some of which you're talking about actual games that were won and lost on the field. But there there are circumstances with ties and standings that, that sent certain teams here or there. And, and there's a lot to uncover and unravel with a lot of these situations. Uh, the, the one thing, though, you bring up about the Notre Dame game in 1993, the argument could be made for the Irish that they should have been playing in the national championship game because they won the head-to-head -head and both teams had one loss. Agree. They, they would have an argument, but that didn't – I mean, it's – if we go back and we look at a lot of stuff, like I believe that um, – I believe LSU has a, a national championship that wasn't – that was unfairly taken away from. I also believe Georgia has a national championship that was unfairly taken away from them um, recently. LSU, um, when LSU and Alabama played for the national championship, LSU beat Bama at Bama um, nine to six, I believe. Yes. And I believe if you beat somebody head to head in your conference, you don't have you you should not have to play them again. And having to play them again in a national championship game put LSU, I mean, that wasn't right. So, I mean, that happens. Um, I also believe Georgia, when Alabama, the last national championship that Bama won, Bama did not win their their conference. Georgia won the conference fair and square. They beat the they beat the team that beat Bama. You should not have to like if that if that's you know we can go back and forth um, there, but there's also been the other thing that I don't reason why I don't have sympathy is if we look at all the years during the 15 year run that FSU had. One loss that in the teams that won the national championship with one loss did not have the schedule that FSU faced because they weren't in a conference. But they said conference affiliation, conference is you know, you get rewarded for certain things. So, like, I don't you know feel any sympathy for them because the goal line has always been moved for FSU when it comes to championships. Hell, even though I, I even though I say that about LSU. LSU won a national championship with two losses, which probably should have never occurred. But the BCS formula um, put them in the uh, put them in it, so uh, things happen. Well, believe me, James, uh, I've talked about this stuff for for years and, and shot so many videos on this stuff because, again, I just like to put things in perspective. And sometimes team was afforded an opportunity to win, and to their credit, they took advantage and they won. But team A, B, and C, there's like three other teams that had just as good a resume, if not better, and they just weren't given the opportunity. So if we're going to award, re-award a national championship, some years you could say, ah, eh, there's about three teams. That's why they have multiple, you know, AP gives their championship, coaches poll gives theirs. Um, that's why you have the split national champions and things of that nature. But, um, I mean, it was – more so a popularity contest for years, which I also believe actually led to college football becoming more popular. Like, there was always something to be talked about. I think the playoffs makes it more finite and, and defined, which is nothing wrong with that. But 
Um, that or let me rephrase that. That's not the problem with the playoff. There's a lot of other things that's wrong with what's going on with college football, but that's another story. But I think, um, you know, you you set your schedule, you make your schedule competitive, and you win every game. And you have nothing to worry about. When you lose a game, you it's just like with referee. Like you used to play a clean football game. Don't let it come down to the refs. Even if the refs did make bad calls, if you don't allow the refs to get involved, you ain't got to worry about that. So if you win every game on your schedule, you don't have to worry about if there's going to be controversy. Unless you're UCF and you have like the 120th ranked schedule. That's it. And uh, you're going to have a chance next time we get together to uh, kind of air some of those concerns. So next time it's going to be, what would you change about Florida State football? What would you change about ACC football? Ooh. What would you change about college football nationally? Man, that's so you a- simmer on those and uh, I got to move on. James, we appreciate you stopping by as always, man. Anytime, man. Appreciate you, Mark.